The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of CATV2, Oshkosh Community Access Television, the City of Oshkosh, the Oshkosh Cable Television Advisory Commission, or Time Warner Cable. Hi everyone, welcome to another edition of Ayan Oshkosh. I'm Cheryl Hans along with my co-host Tony Palmieri. And uh, we haven't done another viewpoint for some time, so we're going to tackle one this evening. Yes, without, so. without Melanie, this is, I'm going to call it the kinder, gentler, another <laughs> viewpoint. We'll see. Although I'll try and throw a few zingers out there. There you go. There you go. Okay. Keep me laughing because But that's never as appealing as Melanie. <laughs> Well, she yeah. well, and maybe not as funny. <laughs> she she had no. uh, a certain sense of humor about her. Right. Um, a few things from a local standpoint. Um, you know, we're we're taping this just two nights after the um, uh, the April twenty sixth council meeting, which was actually the first real council meeting with mm -hmm. the new council being seated. And um, you know, it it didn't um, it didn't surprise me the way things sort of happened. Did no. it you? No. Um, the no. only difference is now it's a 1-6 or a 6-1 vote as opposed to a 5-2 or 2-5. So Yeah, I mean, for people who believe that the council should be run with as little internal dissension as possible, for people who believe that the council should not get involved in extended discussions of issues, this is their ideal council. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that first meeting demonstrated where this council will, will go. Mm -hmm. So if you, for someone who supported the definition of progress, that was given throughout the campaign, this is their dream council. Yeah. Well, and you know, the, the first meeting where they actually got to talk about some things and, and try and reorganize their, their, their themselves and put, a, put forth some new rules, yeah. um, that happened, of course, the Tuesday prior to this full-blown meeting. Right. And um, I think that that said something about where the council's going to, because there was a big discussion about citizen statements. Yeah. And Frank Tower um, brings forth this thing where he wants to do away with Incredible. citizen statements. I, I couldn't On the basis it. that Appleton and Fond du Lac don't have as much citizen statements as we, as we have. Yeah, or they don't have any or something, and I, and I something find, like I, that. What I find interesting, Cheryl, you can probably identify with this. We, in Oshkosh, we can't mimic other cities for economic development. Right. They don't know what they're doing with economic right. development. But when it comes to taking away citizen statements, then we can liberally mimic <laughs> yeah, yeah. other communities. Yeah. It's just, just incredible. Well, you know, and it, and it went from doing away with them all together to then Burke Tower brought up this idea about limiting them to like every quarter. Well, who's going to, who's going to be the gatekeeper on that? Who's going to sit so, there so with Pam, a scorecard? So Pam, the city card? clerk, would take a scorecard. They'd be like, would she have like photos of all the citizens? <laughs> Like and we little, can replay the tape. A little and say, butterfly oh, no, you, ballot, you like here, in Florida. Yeah. You were here three months ago, so no, 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 you can't. Discuss but I guess, anything. I guess, in fairness to the Twin Towers, they they are responding. I mean, you and I have never been on the city council, and it it must not be fun to sit there and get yeah. screamed at and yelled at by a couple of people, essentially. Mm. And, I, and I wish they would mention names. They're always talking about Mr. Dooley and Mr. Bender, mm -hmm. but everyone talks around that. Have yeah. you noticed? Why don't yeah. they just mention it? But if you're bothered by those two guys. To eliminate the, the citizen statements, the analogy I've been using is that's like curing uh, dandruff by decapitation. <laughs> I yeah. mean, you know, there's got to be way. I, I think the best way to deal with it is, is uh, get up and speak yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Mr. Cornell, uh, who spoke the other night in citizen statements, mm -hmm. he spoke, and I like Mr. Cornell. Yeah. He's a really great guy. But he got up to use citizen statements to tell us why we don't need citizen statements. Right. And I thought, by his logic, he could have easily just emailed the council sure. or, or telephoned the council. He clearly found something valuable mm -hmm. about using the citizen statement. And I, I would vociferously oppose getting rid of the uh, 
citizen statements. Right. Well, I and you know, Frank Tower is right. A lot of communities don't have citizen right. statements. But uh, does that mean, like you said earlier, that we have to follow in their footsteps? Because God knows we don't follow in their footsteps with anything else. Mm -hmm. We don't follow in their footsteps when it comes to the forms of government that they have. Right. Um, we don't follow in their footsteps when it comes to economic development and TIF district uh, uh, yeah. Ideolo yeah. ideologies and, yeah. and things like that. So, uh, you know, why, why should we follow in any other community's footsteps for something like citizen statements? Yeah, and actually, I tell you, I think the reason this didn't pass, the elimination of the citizen statements, is because of uh, the efforts of the OshkoshNews.org, the blogging and mm -hmm. all that, we were able to get the candidates on record as saying they supported citizen statements. So really, if you think about it, uh, Shirley Maddox, Meredith Shireman, Brian Bain especially, there was no way they could have voted to get rid of citizen statements. But Brian Bain wanted to do away with them. Although he voted to keep them, I believe. Well, there wasn't really a vote per se, was there? Wasn't there? Wasn't there? Sort of was there not a vote for a, a tower or for, or the, one of the towers' proposals? You know, I I can't remember if right. there was or or wasn't. But I, mean, I thought he, they end, I thought I thought it ended up being the two towers and Mr. Castle that essentially voted to get rid of the citizen statements. There I, may have I been a be vote. Wrong. I I had to I had to get back to work, and right, so there right. there may have been a vote. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, the bottom line is they clearly. You could see before any vote may have taken right. place, you could clearly see the way they were lining up. And Brian Bain was one of the first ones out of the chute saying, right. you know, essentially, we don't need them. Hmm. But I, 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 in the long run, I do think that he, that he ended up uh, su supporting them. My, my frustration with citizen statements is I, I don't think um, that they really have as much impact as people think because mm -hmm. too many counselors, unfortunately, have already made their minds up. I mean, we, we've seen this on the council for many, many years, mm -hmm. that a person comes to, to the council meeting as an elected official and already have, have their mind made up, and it really doesn't matter what people say. And I don't know, how, what's your feeling on that? Shouldn't an elected no, official think keep that, their mind open? I think that they should, and, and I would agree that they pretty much have their minds made up before they go in. But I think even though you've got some idea of how you're going to vote, you know, at least be open-minded enough to yeah. listen to what the people are saying because yeah. somebody might make an impassioned um, argument about something that is enough to sway you. Yeah, I mean half the time, I mean I, I speak at the council maybe four or five times a year. I'd like to speak there maybe 12 to 15 times a year, but most times I feel is it really going to matter? Yeah. Why am I going to bother well, with this? You know, and, and maybe that's the same kind of apathy then, why people won't go to the polls. Right. You know, I, I don't know. I'm at a loss to figure this out. But I do agree that some of the citizen statements have gotten out of hand. And it is sure. from a couple of people, it seems. Um, you know, but, you know, the thing about, you mentioned Ken Bender. Ken, if, if he gets out of line, he will come back and apologize. Right, right. I have never heard Gordon Dooley apologize to anyone for anything that he has said. And, and this is a man who, who literally, and, and Gordon's a sweet old man, mm -hmm. you gotta love him. And, and he's got some good points, but you don't, no matter how much you disagree with these folks, um, you know, you don't sit there and yell and scream. Right. And he literally yells and screams yeah. at these people to yeah. the point where they have to shut the microphone off. And it's yeah. not just the city council. He did this at the county board meeting, mm -hmm. um, you know, last week as well. So they just, they end up shutting his mic off. Right. And at least at the county board, they went on with additional business. Right. I mean, they just, his mic was cut. <laughs> One of the county board supervisor's mics was turned on, yeah. and they continued with their business. Yeah, and I, and I, you know, I think Gordon. I think that probably could have been resolved a long time ago if the if the council had simply interacted with him. Mm -hmm. It be instead it became a belligerent kind of uh, interaction where he became convinced that they don't want to listen to him. So now he's going to keep repeating it as many times as he has to until they just. Maybe his theory is they'll at some point they'll get so sick of hearing it they'll just do whatever he wants them yeah. to do. Well, but, I, I mean, sometimes interaction with a citizen can have a real positive impact. Well, and, and I know that uh, from, from talking to Paul Esslinger, Paul has discussed things ad nauseum with Gordon yeah. Dooley, and, yeah. and so did Melanie when she was on the council. Mm -hmm. And she's not even on the council anymore, right. hasn't been for, you know, three years, four years, whatever it right. is, maybe it's not quite that long. But, um, you know, right. he still 
to this day calls her. Oh yeah. Wanting to get her involved sure, in things sure. and, and so forth. So I don't know that talking sure. to him would really solve the problem. Well, and I, I think it had to be done at the right time mm -hmm. and it wasn't done when it, when it could yeah. have had an, an, an impact. I mean, publicly talk, talk with him. So, but again, it goes, it boils down to should one person result in all of citizen statements being taken mm -hmm. away? And I think not. No, I, I don't no. think so. The other either. thing that happened at that organizational meeting, which I think was interesting, was Shirley Maddox uh, got them to pass a new rule that they all have to explain mm -hmm. their no votes. That's great. Yeah, it is. I think that's great. Because sometimes people vote yes or no, and you sit there wondering why did they vote that mm -hmm. way? And now they have to sit there and explain why they're voting. No, I yeah. think that's very, very healthy. Well, it is. You know, they should be explaining their vote either way. Absolutely. You know, so at least we can kind of peek into their psyche a little bit and, and find out what their their thought process is. Yeah. yeah. Um, the um, other thing uh, about citizen statements and, and that whole reorganizational meeting, you know, I've, I've been a critic of, of uh, Shirley Maddox's, and, um, you know, I certainly debated Meredith Shireman mm -hmm. on, on a number of different issues uh, sure. in a variety of venues. Um, but I was very, very proud of both of them for standing up for the protection of citizen statements because it, it's like uh, Meredith Shireman said, you know, we just finished running a campaign that was partially at least predicated on a more open government mm -hmm. and and here they are trying to shut a part of it down by way of doing away with citizen statements absolutely so absolutely. I, I was very proud of both of them and and uh, I, I applaud them for their efforts um, but getting back to the um, the, the first full-blown council meeting one of the um, things that I thought was really interesting about that um, and it actually was a pretty contentious topic that night, was mm -hmm. Paul Esslinger's proposal uh, for an ordinance change that would reduce the fees <laughs> at the zoo. And that brought out, <laughs> you know, um, Heidi Strand, yeah. who I've never seen behave the way she behaved at that council yeah, meeting. Yeah, very, uh, very belligerent and attacking. I've known Just Heidi for a while. I've always known her to be a very pleasant uh, person. and. That was a side of her that I'm, maybe even she was surprised um, came out just very very angry, um, convinced that uh, Paul Esslinger was grandstanding mm -hmm. and basically tried hadn't to done his homework, hadn't done his homework, undermining the Parks Advisory Board and mm -hmm. so on and so forth, and it seemed to get very very personal. And in actual fact, I mean, his proposal was to basically have the fee. Mm -hmm. Right. And, all right, fine. If you think it's a bad idea, great. It's a bad idea. We should keep the fee the way it is. I didn't understand the need to assess motive. No. Well, and, and what would be benefited or gained by his grandstanding on that particular issue? I, don't I mean, know. after all, he's trying to help save the taxpayers some money here. Yeah. And, and his whole motivation, um, as I believe he may have said when he was here the last time, was because they had just two weeks earlier passed this thing that would take $57,000 right. and put it into fencing. Right. And he just felt that if there was that much money sitting there for these additional types of exhibits, that give, fine, give the taxpayers a break then and cut the fee structure in half. Yeah. And, um, you know, on my website in particular, people have been just beating the crap out of him um, in the last day or two, <laughs> saying that, yes, he was grandstanding and, and he tried to circumvent the process because this didn't go before the Parks Board hmm. prior to coming to the council. Well, first of all, okay, that may be the typical process, but with the zoo opening a week or two from the date of that meeting, there wasn't enough time to get it in front of the Parks Board, and he right. was trying to be... Um, you know, considerate of the the citizenry, right. and thinking about how labor intensive it might be for the the parks department to have one fee structure going into the season and then another fee structure, you know, a few weeks or so well, after. And I, you know, and I imagine that uh, Esslinger must have known there was no way in the world this was going to pass. I'm sure so, he probably So did. one school of thought would be, if you know it's not going to pass then don't even bother bringing it up. Mm -hmm. Another school of thought is it's your responsibility as an elected official if you think you have a way to save people money and you're apparently he's not sold on the elk exhibit and no. the fencing for it, then he's obligated to do what he 
what he believes. And so I applaud him for getting the idea out. I mean, I'm not sold on the elk exhibit yet. No. Maybe I will be once it comes. No. But I, I think a good open debate about the nature of the zoo and where it's headed is a good debate to have. I don't think it has to degenerate into personal attacks. Right. Well, at least Paul stuck up for himself. And, yeah. and he, in fact, had done homework. And he told Heidi Strand as much. But Yeah, in fact, he, I didn't even know this survey existed. He pulled out a survey of over 700 users of the zoo, is that mm -hmm, correct? Mm -hmm. At which they, this was, would have been 2001? I, I believe so, I can't 2000, 2001, the, the, the users <coughs> said they would be willing to pay, I can't remember the figure, but essentially what he wanted to reduce it to. I, I think that so, was true. Okay, yeah. so, and, and originally those were the fees, right? Mm -hmm, so then right. we raised them. I, when, when the city did raise the fees, I never knew that that survey existed. Mm -mm. So what was the rationale for raising the fees? It was for zoo improvements, right? I think now, so. Now, zoo, zoo improvements, that is very subjective. As, as, as m several counselors said the night of the meeting, not every, when, when you say zoo improvement, not everyone thinks that that means adding additional animals to the zoo. Right. You Some, think of maintenance. I don't, you know. I, well, now we know that it doesn't mean just maintenance. It no. means adding additional... <laughs> Uh, exhibits and lots of numbers were thrown out about the additional numbers of people you're going to get. We'll see. I hope they are keeping good well, record of that. But you know, with additional exhibits, you're going to have additional cost. Right. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if, at budget time later this year, if we see, um, you know, something in in the Parks Department budget for another staff person. Um, that I mean, I'm not saying that that's going to happen, but it certainly won't surprise me if it does. But you know. It, the interesting thing is, one of the other uh, points, um, just if I can go back for mm -hmm. a second, is people are saying that Paul was trying to circumvent the process, right. you know? And it's interesting how they will pick on him for circumventing the process, yet they didn't jump up and down and scream at the top of their lungs when the process was circumvented by the um, bids being waived. <laughs> <laughs> for the, for the amphitheater oh, bathrooms no. and concession area and let's face it that whole thing was brought about because oh we have to waive the bids on this we have to get this done now because time is of the essence and Brian Bain new council member Brian Bain before he was elected was one of the proponents for that very waiving of the bid mm -hmm. so you know again if you want to complain about Paul circumventing a process, right. then why are they not complaining? Why have they not complained about the circumvention of the process with some of these other things? What's that old saying, heads I win, tails you lose? Yeah, yeah. It's one, you know, it's one of those. And look at all the times the council will, will waive the, yeah. you know, the, the um, you're supposed to on an ordinance change, I believe, have two readings of it. Mm -hmm. They'll waive the first reading and right. they'll make a decision on it that very night. Nobody seems to be complaining about that. Mm -hmm. But Paul trying to save the taxpayers some money and have some consistency, that seems to be a big problem. Well, we'll see. I mean, I, I don't get around the city probably as much as, as you do, but I, I haven't seen people jumping up and down asking for more animal exhibits. No. Maybe they are. I mean, we'll soon, we'll soon find out. Um, I, I do hear people saying things like it would be nice to have that Pollock pool. Yeah. So if we're, if we're charging fees for an animal exhibit, there's one school of thought that says, well, maybe we should have found a way to raise more money for that pool yeah. to save that. So, I mean, I, I see it as about priorities, and I'm not always convinced that the city's priorities are, are in order. I, and I hope that they're right. I hope that the, that the elk exhibit brings more people to Oshkosh. Well, we'll you see. know, but some of the discussion on, on the Ion Oshkosh website has been, you know, how much stuff can you keep putting in this park? Uh, you can only put so much stuff there. And, you know, it used to be a very beautiful park, still is in many respects, mm -hmm. but that stockade fencing looks horrible. And now, just before I came over here tonight, I looked at the website again, and someone else had said that the elk exhibit is not going to be taking up any more space. It's going to be put within a fenced-in area that's already yeah. in existence. Well, if that's the case, then why do we need $57,000 worth of fencing, I guess? I don't understand that. Um, and that was the point that somebody had made, as a matter of fact. So mm -hmm. I, I guess I, and I don't know, maybe that person right. isn't, isn't accurate about what they're saying. Right. I, 
I don't know exactly where it's going. Well, you know, you know, my position was on the amphitheater that the city should have managed it. Mm -hmm. And I think now that we've got all this, we see now all the energy goes toward managing Menominee Park. I think a lot of that energy could have been put toward uh, uh, managing the amphitheater. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, another shocking thing at that last council meeting, I think it was Esslinger who asked the question to the city manager, if, if somebody wants to have a wedding or a yes. high school graduation at the amphitheater, it turns out you have to clear it through through PMI. Yes. And I, you know, and I, you know, I've been attacked over email by a lot of people on my views on this. Mm -hmm. But I, I still persist. I'm just naive, I guess. This was this was articulated as a gift to the citizens mm -hmm. of Oshkosh, which, when we got the gift, I thought it meant that whenever a high school wants to use it, either a nominal or no fee. Weddings, local musicians, it's looking to me like it's a gift to PMI. <laughs> I mean, I, again, yeah. I, you know, I hate to be cynical. I want it to work desperately. Yeah. I want people to go downtown and use that amphitheater. I know I plan to go. But do you see it now as a gift to the city? Well, Tony, I really haven't for a very long time, probably since the very beginning. If it was just the amphitheater by itself, it would have right. been a gift. But a gift doesn't come with strings attached. And we heard right from the very first workshop on this right. thing that this needed to be pushed through, otherwise the gift might be taken back. So all these other things had to come along with it. Hmm. And that, that has been my problem all along. Just put up the amphitheater and be done with it. I just, see, my vision of it was I thought this was going to be a great municipal amphitheater where I think we're capable of getting groups in town to serve beer and hot dogs. We Waterfest has been doing that for years. Yeah. I think the city can do that. We've got tons of local bands. I thought it was going to, and we know a lot of people would use it for events. I thought if the city ran it, you could have unlimited free events mm -hmm. at the amphitheater. But no, we can't, we can't do that. Well, anyhow, nope. I, I hate to kick a dead horse because this is over with now for the most part. Although, right. although we're not in phase two yet, are we? Are we? No. No. Do we know what is phase two? I don't know offhand. Okay, we'll find <coughs> out shortly. There's, but, there's yeah. a phase two and possibly an additional phase beyond that. Is so. it going to? Are they putting seats by the amphitheater? You'll have to carry in your own seat. It, well, either a blanket to sit on the grass, or okay. you sit on the grass, just with the grass okay. underneath your rear end. Because um, if I had to make one prediction, I would say in the next two to three years it will become clear that if three, four, five thousand people are going in there. If we charge five dollars for parking, you know that that tends to agitate people to begin with. Mm -hmm. So now you've paid your five dollars. You're carrying your chair. It can be very unwieldy there. Do you think it's unrealistic to say in a year or two we'll get a a proposal to put in some seating? Well, I don't know about some seating, but there might be a proposal. I'm guessing for some parking, a parking structure of some kind. I mean, Tony, you've got possible seating. They say for seven thousand people. Yeah. Well. And you've got parking for only a couple hundred. Mm -hmm. Where is everyone going to go? Yeah. Um, and I don't care. <laughs> you know, Shirley Maddox has said, well, this will be great for the businesses downtown. Right. Well, as we've said in the past, the businesses downtown are going to be closed in the evening hours for yeah. the most part when these events are taking place. Mm. But even if you parked up and down Main Street, is there that much parking, you know, to accommodate all these people? I just don't see how this is going to work. So it wouldn't surprise me if we see uh, something coming forward for a parking structure at some point down the road. And, you know, this is right there by the convention center. We've heard mm. talk about wanting to expand the convention center and this, that, and the other. Right. So maybe the proposal will be for um, a parking structure to accommodate both the amphitheater and the convention center. Okay, we'll see. You know, last week you and I talked to Bob Peschel and we were talking about poverty and low-income mm -hmm. issues for a while. Is there a theory out there in the city that the amphitheater is somehow going to help? I mean, is, there, is, the, is the theory that this is going to spark a kind of economic development that will help low-income people at all? I don't know. I, I, I don't think it is. Okay. Because I keep... Because anytime anyone is critical of any of these projects, what gets thrown back in, in gets <laughs> thrown back is this is economic development. Well, is it, in a way? I mean, again, I hope it succeeds. I, want, I, I don't like being critical about these things. I want them to succeed. 
I mean, I was critical about the 100 block building. Mm -hmm. I don't like the fact that it's not at full occupancy. I don't like the fact that the, that the basement is, uh, or the first floor is, is empty. But on the other hand, when these criticisms were made years ago, obviously nobody was listening. Right. You know, then the, then the <coughs> project gets, gets built and then you're still told that you're wrong. Well, but see, I think that there's a difference, Tony, between being critical mm -hmm. and, and exercising critical thinking, right. which is a good thing, and being negative. And I think far too often people in this community have a tendency to, um, you know, say to those of us who are trying to use some sound judgment right. and, some, and some common sense reasoning mm -hmm. that we're being negative. I don't view it as being negative. I view it as being a critical thinker, right. trying to think logically about certain things. Right. Do I have all the answers, and am I always right? Absolutely not. But I don't think that people should be put down for challenging some of these people and saying, hey, you know what, you're doing it wrong. You haven't planned this thing through, as in the case of the amphitheater. Um, if, if this had been planned out, and had gotten public input, I don't think that you'd have the people upset in this community that we do. I think you're right. I you think know, you're right. But it's and the it's way in which they go about things. They try and sneak things in through the back door by working behind the scenes and, as Melanie Bleckel always called them, puppeteers, <laughs> you know, and shadow government. And, yeah. you know, years ago, I think you and I both maybe thought, well, you know, how much of this is really accurate? Or is she maybe just a little cynical? Sure. But look how much we've seen over the course of the last several years. Yeah. Well, the idea is that so-called professional government mm -hmm. doesn't have politicking behind the scenes, and I think that's been demonstrated mm -hmm. to be completely false. Right. There probably is as much of a kind of informal horse trading <laughs> in uh, professional government as there was in the old mayor system. The difference is who's trading... Wouldn't surprise me if there's well, the, more. The difference is who's trading the horses. Mm -hmm. It's done largely outside the, the view of the public. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it's why we need people to watch over to keep their eye on Oshkosh, mm -hmm. yeah. um, if you will. And it's not always going to sound pleasant, but it's, right. uh, but it's necessary. Right. But, you know, Oshkosh obviously is not the only city experiencing this. I, uh, at UW Oshkosh, we had uh, Jay Heck from Common Cause in Wisconsin mm -hmm. and Mike McCabe from the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign. They came to give a speech on political reform in this state. And they said in their presentation, both of them uh, uh, said this off camera, and I think one of them said it, uh, we have it videotaped, should be on OCAT soon. There's an unprecedented attempt in Wisconsin from the, what they call the development community, big developers, to literally take over city councils, hmm. setting up political action committees and so on and so mm -hmm. forth, largely because they've seen in every city there are people here that are called cobblestoners mm -hmm. who want to have control of development in their city. Right. And the, the so-called development com community has fought back very, very effectively. I mean, we saw what happened this year. Yep. Um, lots of money spent to get people on the council. I'm willing to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. But a ton of money was spent, and most people who ran and who won called themselves pro-development. Mm -hmm. Now, what we'll see what that means. Yeah. Everybody is yep. pro-development to an extent. Sure. But we'll see what, what it means in terms of the actual developments that get built. I, I agree. <clears throat> um, did you have anything else on the city that you wanted to, to talk about? Just that I think people should wake up and realize that if they're not vigilant, we will lose citizen statements. Mm -hmm. And then that becomes a slippery slope. It'll start with citizen statements, and then all of a sudden it's the statements during the consent agenda, mm -hmm. right? Then before you know it, you'll have to fill out a form to go and speak yeah. at the council. Um, I don't think we want to go down that road. So even if people feel irritated and upset by certain citizen statements, they still have, it should be in their interest to defend them. Well, I agree. You know, um, there, I, I had an idea. I mean, I don't know what you do with, with someone who is just completely over the top at these council <laughs> meetings. There was, there was a suggestion, um, and uh, Stu Rickman from the Northwestern fully supports this idea, um, that the cameras should just be turned off during citizen statements. And, and that too, I think, is wrong. It's a disservice to those people who can't make it to the council meeting, but who, who watch it at home. And they're thinking that, that see, 
the problem here is that so many people think that if if you are a somewhat of a contrarian or you take mm -hmm. a contrarian approach or you are critical of someone that you're grandstanding right and that just simply isn't the case they're thinking here that if the cameras are turned off that that's going to stop people like ken bender no or way. gordon dooley and I've got news for them. I have covered some of these meetings where, you know, I've been at county board meetings covering those meetings where they're not being taped that night for view on, on Channel 10. Right. And yet, Mr. Dooley is still there. And oh, yeah. he's still in front of the microphone. And this man has probably spoken out at meetings since long before OCAT came along, I'm only assuming here on this because I, oh, I, yeah. I don't know, but I would oh, have yeah. to believe, as involved as he is, that that this has been going on for a lot yeah. longer than these meetings yeah. have it's been not, televised. It's, not that that's, it's just a ridiculous argument. Uh, the people who speak at Citizen Statements in Oshkosh, cameras on, cameras off, they're going to speak. In fact, I think probably the cameras, to a point, intimidate people. Mm -hmm. it, it's intimidating just for a lot of people to get up there in front of those seven council members and some of the city staff and the audience that is there in person, much less knowing that they've got a TV audience. Absolutely. Now, for people like us, you know, we're in front of cameras on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't bother us, for, but for the ordinary Joe, that's a very intimidating very, venue to be in. Very intimidating. And, and so they're, they're not there just to, you know, get their face on TV and have their voices heard. And, and that's not, um, you know, I'm not putting that out there saying, well, there's a reason to turn the cameras off because <laughs> it would make the, the citizenry more comfortable. Yeah. It, it just, I, I think that's a bad policy. I agree completely. Um, soccer fees in the county park. The county board recently um, has, has uh, voted on this issue. Um, the parks department for the county had, had, proposed a $25 per game per field uh, fee for organized soccer clubs. And um, I, I kind of supported that. I felt that that was probably a, a, a reasonable thing to do. I thought $25 might be a little high, but I, I thought that the fees were probably reasonable. Uh, there is additional upkeep that has to go into you know, maintaining fields for soccer. Um, but well, it aren't, got, your, aren't your tax dollars already going to to upkeep the parks? Well, yeah, but um, the Parks Department's argument is that they have to do special things mm -hmm. with these fields. And, you know, with the threat of Tabor and, and some of the right. cuts and, and that kind of thing, I mean, that's why we're instituting fees in the city and, mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, but this thing failed, and I'm trying to remember what it failed by. I think it was. I think it was like 2113, 2114. Yeah, I th there like were 14, yeah. and and then maybe 24, because there's right. 38 members, and I think all 38 were there that night. Oh, were they? Okay. I, th I think they might have been, yeah. Um, well, but, a lot of citizens showed up to speak. I mean, there I were think, a lot of them. I think that had to sway some of the supervisors. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know, and, and that too has gotten a lot of discussion on, on the websites about this. Are um, most people against the fees? I think a lot of them were. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of them were. Um, I, I don't know. I think, like I said, $25 might have been a little too steep. But um, fees, whether we like them or not, they're becoming a way of life. Uh, at all levels of government, too. Mm -hmm. where yep. And, of course, they're not taxes. They're, <laughs> they're, they're fees. But, right. uh, well, maybe some fees are just fees. Uh, mm -hmm. Others probably are a substitute for or taxes. You know, at the state level, um, the problem is that the establishment parties have really put themselves in an absurd position. Mm -hmm. they, they give big corporations massive tax breaks. They run their campaigns on the uh, argument that no tax can be raised. They need money, mm -hmm. so they've got to go to fees. Yeah. They've put themselves in a position where there's really no other uh, option and now we're seeing the same thing really happen at the uh, at the local level. I mean, I think what's needed at all levels of, of government is tax fairness, and you never hear, mm -hmm. right? You know, you never hear that discussion. Who exactly is paying what? Well, we don't hear fairness no uh, too much with anything these days. No, no, it doesn't. It doesn't come up. And at the, of course, what's especially provoking anger at the state level is that they can't get their fiscal house in order, mm -hmm. yet they're ready to bash localities over the head. Right. 
with things like Tabor or any of these so-called tax freeze uh, schemes that they're throwing out. And I don't know. I mean, I don't think Tabor is going to pass, but I do think that Doyle is, is feeling pressured to come up with something. Mm -hmm. So my guess is that there probably will be some kind of tax freeze passed. Yeah. They won't call it Tabor but it will be a tax freeze, and that's going to make budgeting at the local level very, very t difficult. Well, it is, and I've, I've not been a proponent of Tabor since right. it was um, first introduced. But, you know, on the other hand, uh, looking at this from a devil's advocate point of view, um, you know, maybe some kind of taxpayer bill of rights mm -hmm. isn't a bad idea necessarily. When, when you take a look at some of the things that our local city council has done of late, with the amphitheater, for example. I mean, you know, if, if there had been some kind of taxpayer bill of rights in place, they wouldn't have been able to do what they just did, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the last several months. Yeah, so and I don't think Oshkosh is unique in that. I mean, I think every now and then local units of government do something that provides ammunition for, uh, for, for Tabor. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure, is it Frank Lassay is the sponsor of Tabor yeah. in, the, in the legislature? Yeah. He's probably keeping a running... Uh, you know, tally. Oh, I'm sure he's got his projects. scorecard there and he's right. checking it off. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, I don't know. Um, you brought something here that, uh, that yes. you wanted to we chat can talk about. about it for, for a couple of minutes here. Uh, by the time people see this, this, this is the uh, April edition of the Valley Scene that I write a monthly column for. Um, in the April issue, I wrote a story, the cover story called Fighting Reactionary Politics. Um, real liberals, real conservatives, and real radicals must work together. And again, by the time you see the show, the, the May issue of The Valley Scene will be out. If you want to see a copy of the piece that I wrote, I, it's on my website, tonypalmary.com. But the reason why I wrote this, um, this story, Cheryl, is because, and I'm sure you've noticed this, terms like conservative and liberal get thrown out by every politician and pundit and yet, what do they mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're sh they've become sheer propaganda terms. The Republicans are conservatives. The Democrats are liberals. Mm -hmm. what, what, is that, what does that really mean? Mm -hmm. And so what I try to do in this story is try to provoke people to think about some real, honest definitions of those terms and try to put some integrity back in our language so that they're not just propaganda terms. And so, for example, a real conservative, historically, is someone that argues from tradition or from the law. Okay. All right? So, for example, why don't we apply it to the city of Oshkosh? Mm -hmm. Bid waving. Okay. Right? You know, the conservative view on bid waving is, what do the statutes say mm -hmm. we can do? And the argument that, well, in some cases you don't need to look at the statutes because, you know, our city attorney says that we're clear, mm -hmm. that's not necessarily a conservative uh, argument. Conservatives argue according to the law. Mm -hmm. And if, we're, if you, uh, big on the Bill of Rights especially, if we're talking about the federal level, if you look at modern-day conservatives, so-called conservatives, often they never even refer to the Constitution. All right. All right. And yet a real conservative always refers back to the law. A real liberal argues from circumstances. They say that there are certain situations that require action. Mm -hmm. So Franklin Roosevelt would have been a liberal in the sense that we were mired in depression when he came into office in 1932. He started all these federal programs, correct, mm -hmm. to respond to the, okay. to the situation. A real liberal believes government has to intervene. You know, if you think about it, lots of Republicans are liberals in this sense these days. They've got their own kinds yeah. of programs, right? Right. Um, a radical is someone who argues from principle. We ought to act according to, to justice and so on. And a radical believes that people are essentially rational. They can handle their own mm -hmm. uh, affairs. So that the Declaration of Independence, 1776, is a radical document. All people are endowed with inalienable rights and so on and so forth. And a real radical believes you have to pressure a government. So what I'm arguing in this piece is that if you define conservative, liberal, and radical in their true sense, they're all very noble. Mm -hmm. I have no problem with conservatives, no problem with liberals, and America is the 
you know, radicalism has produced some great things over the, over the years. But the term that very few people ever talk about, and this is the problem, is what we call reactionaries. Okay. And the, the reactionaries are the ones like King George III. Mm -hmm. I'm the boss. You do what I say. The reactionaries believe that people are too irrational to run their own affairs. You have to trust bureaucrats to do it for them. I would argue that most cities these days are run in a reactionary way. Haven't, oh. you, haven't you noticed this in, a, in, a, in local government? Mm -hmm. If you try and question development projects, you don't know what you're talking about. Right. Right? TIF districts. You have, to, you have to have a master's degree in public administration <laughs> to be able to say anything intelligent about TIFs. Mm -hmm. Essentially, the attitude in most cities these days is you just go away and let us run things. Right. That's reactionary politics. And I'm arguing in this article that real conservatives, real liberals, real radicals have to fight that. Mm -hmm. We have to take control of our cities, of our state government, and even of the federal government and resist these attempts by bureaucrats, by elected officials, by corporate executives or whoever to basically tell us that we should butt out. Right. Yeah. I mean, the nature of America is that the people never butt out. <laughs> the people are always in. Mm -hmm. And yet we've got this problem of reactionary politics. And I, you know, I, what really got me going on this, on this piece was mostly local politics. Mm -hmm. right? I, I'm tired of something like tax incremental financing, for example, always being identified as a good. Yeah. I think the, 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 the right thing to do is to try and understand what it is and if there are situations where we can, this is the conservative argument now, if we're really using it in accordance with the state statutes, let's use it mm -hmm. to cure blight. That's the major thing. We're only supposed to use a TIF if the development would not take place without it. Right. All right? Now, you know, for, let me give you an example, Cheryl. Also at the last council meeting, some of this stuff never even gets discussed anymore. Didn't we expand the TIF district for Oshkosh Truck? Yes. Right? Now, it seems to me that was done out of gratitude. I mean, we, we like the fact, I, I'm gracious or, or I'm thankful toward Oshkosh Truck. They're going to put another 100 jobs in the community, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Good paying jobs, right? And so a TIF district is being expanded for this. But TIFs are not supposed to be expanded or created out of gratitude. Right. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is Oshkosh Truck is a, is it a Fortune 500 company? Oh, I, I, think I don't know for certain, but right. I would assume it Close almost to has it. to be. I think they cleared $1.4 billion, yeah. right? The CEO, total compensation is, you know, well $16 over, million, or, yeah. you know, total compensation. Yeah. Are we to believe that Oshkosh Truck is not able to do those infrastructure improvements? <laughs> now, to say, again, I'm not picking on them. They, they thankfully are still here, are creating lots of good jobs in the community, but the purpose of the TIF law is not to say thank you, right? Right. But we're in we're in a political environment now where can any member of that council ever vote against something like that? I don't think so. And and Tony, I don't hear anybody asking any questions. No. Every time no. somebody comes forward with a proposed development, right, and they say, what can the city give us? Right. The city right away offers up a TIF. Yeah. There's no questions that seem to be asked. No, and that's the reactionary politics that I'm, that I'm talking about. And it's, I mean, I think especially in this economic environment, I think that elected officials are afraid, literally afraid, to say no mm -hmm. to any big developer. Well, it seems like they have lost the art of negotiation. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's it's just like if you go to buy a buy a house, mm -hmm. you know, there's there's the price that it's being sold for, right. and you make an offer. Mm -hmm. Rarely, <laughs> if ever, right. do you make an offer for what the asking price is, and and then you kind of know where each other's uh, right. break point is, and you negotiate, and somewhere you right. find a spot in the middle that's right. comfortable for both right. parties. Right. Right. I don't see that. No, in, I don't see that either. City and, and, then what, and then what happens is, in, instead of taking on the problem, I'm calling it like this reactionary control of our politics. Instead of taking that on, we beat each other up mm -hmm. in political campaigns, websites, 
like on your website, we, we have the what I'm calling the internet trolls. <laughs> the people who go in there just to basically demean people, mm -hmm. right? Usually, a, a troll is usually anonymous, right? Yes. Attack people, beat people up. For what purpose? All it does is stifle discussion. Yep. And so what I'm saying in this piece is we've got all this misplaced energy. Mm -hmm. And the real tradition, what I, I, I don't say it in the story, but I did a public radio show on this story and said it. If you go back to 1776, Thomas Paine, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, three of the major founding fathers, they had some deep, deep disagreements between them. Mm -hmm. But the one thing they agreed on was that we can't live under a king. You gotta get rid of King George III. We are in exactly the same environment right now in this country, mm -hmm. locally, statewide, and nationally. Mm -hmm. People at the grassroots level have to agree that even though we might disagree on when to use a tax incremental finance district, right, how high the zoo fees should be and something like that, we should all agree that we need some real small d democracy and anything getting in the way of that has got to be removed. Mm -hmm. But instead, we're, all, we're pitted against each other. And I yeah. think it's, it's unfortunate. The, the Democratic and Republican parties don't make this problem any better because they're the ones that take the terms like conservative and liberal and use them as, as essentially propaganda sure. uh, terms. And so I, I do think there's hope. I mean, I, I do think the majority of people are very thoughtful and realize that this country is about the opportunity to participate. But I think too many of them are intimidated. Mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, as you know, it's not fun getting beat up. No, um, no. In the press. I mean, you have been taken on in the local press in a way like I've never seen any local citizen. <laughs> I mean, in, in editorials. Remember, you were on the zoning board? Well, and I think that's where this all started is because, you know, Ben Ganther, a developer, you know, Ben Ganther is a... Is yeah. a uh, a friend of yeah. some people down at the Oshkosh Northwestern. And I actually had the audacity to speak out and vote no on a project of his. Yeah, and, th and then But th I wasn't the only one. I mean, it failed because there were a majority of us on that board who voted against that project. And then th but yet they picked out me. And what pissed me off, frankly, about that whole thing, Tony, was the fact that of all the things that I laid out, all the reasons that I laid out, mm -hmm under the law as to why I was going to vote against that project, mm -hmm. they picked out one comment that I said that was way at the very bottom of my list mm -hmm. and really was sort of a, um, an offshoot of some of the other stuff. Right. They didn't pick out the real reasons why I was turning it down. And, and that's what irritated me about it. Because again, they're, they're trying to demean, embarrass, and, and then accuse and, you of doing that. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, they, they just is very selective well, in what they do. What I just found incredible was that at that time they wrote an editorial essentially saying that the city should revise the way it picks citizens mm -hmm. based on your performance. And I, I just find that just incredible. Well, it was, it was actually, I, I mean, yes, they singled me out uh, and they put one of my quotes in there, um, taken, I think, a little bit out of context because just based mm -hmm. upon what I just said, but um, they didn't like the way the board voted altogether. So right. it wasn't just revise the way citizens are picked right. just because of what Cheryl Hens did. Yeah. It was it was the board as a whole. You know, we had somehow just shamed the city and uh, aborted <laughs> our our duties and our missions and just had total disregard for the process. That's that's what we what they were trying to say, I think, with their editorial. Well, you know, people are fighting these battles in city after city, and it's the same dynamic um, all over. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote an article a couple of, uh, maybe a year ago, I call it the Iron Triangle of uh, big business, big government, and big media. And when you get those three working together, very, very difficult to get a real citizen's agenda in, in place. And of course, that's the problem at the state level too. Yeah. You know, uh, Ed Garvey down in Madison calls our legislature the lobbyist legislature, hmm. right? And he's trying to start something called the People's Le Legislature. You know, and it's it's kind of sad, Cheryl, because here we are lecturing the Iraqis on democracy, and yet we tolerate so we, we tolerate it being taken away. Mm -hmm. 
in our own uh, communities. I mean, what is it, like 95% of U.S. congressional seats are safe seats? I, d you I can't don't know. Yeah, you, I can't don't even, you can't even challenge these guys. How, you well, know, look I, at how many county board seats go unchallenged, yeah. just locally. Yeah. Yeah, and then, of course, the answer to that is, well, cut them, you know, <laughs> let's make fewer seats. <laughs> Although right. I do think that the size of, of the county board is, is perhaps a little too, too big. But, um, you know, I, I don't know that cutting the size in half yeah. or whatever is it's going to necessarily get more involvement in the county board. No. I think people just don't really understand what the county board does. Um, it's the meetings have historically been for most citizens to sit and watch, I think, kind of boring. Mm -hmm. They don't understand it because they are run somewhat differently than the yeah. city council meeting. And so they don't understand it, therefore they lose interest, and therefore it becomes boring to them. Um, I think and They don't understand yeah, any I, of it. I think big developers do not like large county boards mm -hmm. because, look, it's much easier to get four votes out of a seven-member Oshkosh mm -hmm. Common Council than it is to get 20 votes out of a 38-member Winnebago County right. Board. And these people know that. <laughs> right. I mean, something like w uh, whether the uh, Mercy Medical Center should have been made into a, the new Park View. Mm -hmm. think, of, think about if that had to go through the Oshkosh Common Council. <laughs> think of the developers involved. Would have been done just like that. Just like that, limited public discussion, mm -hmm. demonize the people opposed to it. Yep. Right? You put that in county government, you have at least two committees that have to look at it. You have the full county board. No developers like that. Right. Chambers of Commerce don't like that. So, I mean, I'm one of the few people in the community that has no problems with that 38-member board. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, there's ineptitude in, at levels of all um, government. But mm -hmm. it seems, see, real conservative American government, right, is about checks and balances. Right. The more checks you have in place, the better off we all are. The more checks you have in place, the slower things move. Things are supposed to move slowly. Mm -hmm. That's how they arranged the, the, the founders, because they knew if, if you have government that allows things to go through too quickly, then the passions of the moment are going to rule. And in this time period, it will mean big developers who control the major corporate press mm -hmm. will create you know, any kind of hysteria to get whatever they want through. And so the best government is that government that makes sure things slow down. Right. That's real conservatism. That's an interesting point. I, I, you know, that's, that's good food for thought. Um, you know, people often people say, that. they listen to me speak, well, I must be a radical. I'm actually very, very conservative mm -hmm. according to the true definition of conservatism. You start with the Constitution. You start with your statutes. Uh, my my frustration with our local government is that the statutes almost seem like an afterthought. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we'll we'll do something, then we'll try and figure out what state law says we should do. No, at least that was the case in the way of the uh, in, in the uh, uh, bid waiving situation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think people, again, it, hey, it's up to citizens. Are we going to take our government back, or are we going to let it continue to be run? by powerful, special um, interests. And this is true at all levels of government. Well, and again, you know, people can sit back and say, well, those people who don't become involved and those people who don't vote, um, they're getting exactly the kind of government they deserve. Well, that may be true, but we're also getting a kind of government that we don't deserve. I mean, yeah. we have both run for office. We've both been very active politically. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we've tried making a difference. And, you know, we don't deserve that kind of government, nor do any of the other people who do get out there and exercise their right and their privilege to vote on election day. Right. So these people are hurting not only themselves, but they're hurting everybody else who probably has the same school of thought that they do, but who just have a little bit more ambition to go to the polls. Yeah. So um, it, rarely do I think there is a good reason for not voting. I mean. If you're sick on election day, there's right. a good reason. And obviously, you don't know that you're going to get sick, so you can't have taken the time to fill out an absentee ballot. But mm -hmm. other than being sick or, or some kind of crisis like that, um, I just don't see a reason why people don't go to the polls and vote. I, yeah, I don't. And uh, I think it's especially troubling with the youth. I mean, people under 30 not voting. Because, you know, when you get in a habit of not voting when you're young, 
it can lead to literally an entire lifespan mm -hmm. of, of not voting, and that's problematic. And so we, we need, there has to be some strategy to get young people to run for office. I and mean, I, was, I was really pleased in the last election cycle that in the primary we had some really young people running for office, Bob Peschel, Andrew Korowitz, Jenny Ryan, Jenny Ryan. Um, Brian Bain, you know, young people, uh, Joe Youngworth, you know, mm -hmm. you've got to have young people uh, running. That is the hope for the, uh, for, for the future. And I also think, Cheryl, I, I just think people, uh, I think people are afraid of being beaten up. Yeah. I mean, look what happens to people who are outspoken, especially if they disagree with the power elite in a community. Mm -hmm. How many people have the stomach for the kind of public humiliation, embarrassment? I mean, you have your show mocked in yeah. an executive editor's column almost <laughs> weekly. <laughs> yeah. How many people have the have, have That's the stomach all right. For you know, that? if 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 that's what Stuart Rickman wants to do, that's fine. I mean, you know, I sure I come fine, right yeah. back and I take my pot shots at him. He Me see, too. he doesn't understand. He can't he can't embarrass right. or humiliate people like you and I. No. Other people who, who maybe don't have quite as strong a backbone mm -hmm. um, and who can't let it roll off their backs as we do. Yeah. Eh. I mean, my, you know, my students say to me all the time, I mean, a lot of my students follow the kinds of things I do and so on. And they, they o often look at me very strange and, and they say, Tony or Dr. Palmieri, why, why do you even bother with this? Mm -hmm. they, they see it as a kind of game. Yeah. And th see, this is the kind of jaded and cynical attitude now. They see it as a kind of game in which the winner is already known. Mm -hmm. And all you're doing is knocking yourself out for no purpose. And you know, half the time I go home and I think, maybe they're right. But then I think of Thomas Paine, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and I think, we've got a tradition to uphold in this country. You can't, you cannot give in. Right. You can't give in. The moment you give in, we're going to lose something that I don't want to be too melodramatic here, but in the history of the world, this experiment in representative democracy is the greatest ever created. And like heck, if I'm going to let it be taken away right. by powerful interests in City Hall, Madison, or anywhere else. And I know you see it the same way. A absolutely. Um, we are down to like 45 seconds. Do you want to just real quickly um, thank Jane Vandehei and Brian Peschel? <laughs> Real quickly. Uh, I wrote an article <laughs> on TonyPalmieri.com. I was critical of Jane and Brian, but I kind of missed them. Yeah. Um, in their own way, they stood up for a set of values. Uh, Jane, I never sensed, had the courage of her convictions. One-on-one, -on -one, I thought she was a person of intense compassion and fairness. I thought she kind of didn't govern that way. Brian Peschel, just a fantastic, honorable guy. I think he will be missed. And I, you know, bottom line, um, Cheryl, they took on the chamber yeah. and they paid for it. Okay, very good. Well, and I want to thank them also. And thanks to you. Thanks to Tony. Thank uh, you. We'll see you next time. Take good care. Until then, keep your eye on us. We've got our eye on Oshkosh.